Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, welcome to today's uh, breakout session. Uh, today, our guest speaker will be Mr. Adam Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thompson is an independent consultant uh, partnering with healthcare delivery systems to improve patient and population level outcomes. He currently serves as the co-chair of the Primary Care and Chronic Illness Standing Committee for the National Quality Forum. Um, today, he will discuss the consumer perspectives navigating mental and substance use services. After the presentation, uh, you can utilize the chat box for any questions you may have. Uh, please submit any questions at any time, and we'll be answering some of these at the end of the presentation. Thank you. My name is Adam Thompson. Uh, I am a person with HIV as well as a consultant uh, working with health systems to improve outcomes for patients and communities. Uh, I am so excited to be here today at the Virginia Ryan White Cross Parts Quality Management Summit. Uh, many, many moons ago, uh, I was a member of the Virginia Cross Parts Collaborative Team. Uh, I had an opportunity to work uh, at the very beginning, uh, building some of the capacity building and training opportunities for persons with HIV. So to come back here uh, many, many years later, it is really exciting to see that not only uh, is the Virginia Cross Park team still going, uh, but that this annual event that you all have been having uh, is still happening, uh, even virtual. Uh, before I begin, I also wanted to just take an opportunity to say thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, COVID has asked more of us uh, than <clears throat> I think anyone should ever uh, be asked to do. And yet all over the country, we watch service providers and healthcare providers walk in their doors every day uh, and continue to provide services uh, from a distance, in person, from a car. Uh, and so a big thank you uh, from the community of people that you serve. Uh, your service uh, does not go unnoticed and we are eternally grateful. So I've been asked to come today to share uh, the consumer perspective uh, sort of walking through uh, systems of care, particularly as a person with a history of injection drug use. Uh, when I talk about my experiences with healthcare, I think the word that I've come to most associate uh, with those experiences is trust, uh, either the lack of trust uh, or a sort of buffet of trust available uh, from the care providers. Um, but it seems to be a word along with respect uh, that's becoming more and more important in healthcare these days. So what I wanted to talk about is a little bit of my experience uh, in systems, both as a person with HIV and a person uh, who uses drugs, and then hopefully end on a much uh, happier note uh, and talk a little bit about some ways that I think systems uh, can build trust and build back trust uh, better with patients and clients uh, who maybe have a history of distrust or mistrust. The learning objectives for our engagement today uh, is to demonstrate the impact of distrust on engagement to care, define trust, distrust, and mistrust uh, in the context of health service delivery and sort of compare how those are the same and how they're different, uh, share models for optimal care organization for behavioral health services as a way to uh, think about where are there trust building services uh, and trust building staff members that we could be leveraging more uh, and then lastly, as I said a little earlier, identify strategies uh, that will foster trust in healthcare settings. So when I think about my HIV care, uh, I think <clears throat> that it's really important for me to be honest about the story up front, which is that 97% of all my medical visits, uh, my encounters with Ryan White providers uh, have been amazing. Uh, I am a person who's had an undetectable viral load now since 2006, uh, and I credit a lot of that uh, to the people and the teams that supported me uh, as I was learning to live as a person who wasn't homeless anymore, as a person who wasn't a kid, uh, who had to kind of grow up, <clears throat> and it was my medical case managers. It was the amazing receptionist. Uh, I still remember Carmen uh, like it was yesterday, and this is a decade ago. Uh, but there are those 3% of services that were not so great. And I think it's, you know, really important not to always focus on the bad, to remember that good. But uh, when we're thinking about improvement, <clears throat> and in particular improvement in healthcare, I think it's important to, you know, hyper look at some of those situations where things went really wrong, 
uh, especially if those situations happen at the beginning of care. And if I were to say, where did my healthcare go wrong? <clears throat> it was really, you know, step one. Uh, steps two through a hundred were amazing, but the first was not so good. Uh, my first experience uh, sort of with healthcare as, a, as an adult, someone other than, you know, just a kid kind of going to my pediatrician or being in college and seeing a, you know, like a campus health center uh, was at this kind of little uh, kind of mom and pop <clears throat> doctor's office, right? It was not part of a big health system, single provider. And at the time I was living uh, on the streets of DC, um, I was somewhat housed every now and then with some friends. Uh, my father was also living in Northern Virginia, so I had sort of a little bit of a touch point there. Uh, but I started getting sick. Um, at the time, I was actively using methamphetamine, uh, not a drug that's known to like make you feel super great, uh, but also just kind of living that life of, you know, being in the city 24 hours a day, sleeping on a park bench, waking up, doing more drugs. It's just not a healthy uh, situation. So I started getting these symptoms. And so I said, all right, I'm going to go have this taken a look at. Uh, the symptoms that I were having was kind of like a rash uh, appearing that was kind of weird. Uh, it wasn't super itchy or anything. Uh, and it just kind of didn't look so good. That's what really bothered me about it was here I, you know, a commercial sex working kid on the streets of DC, a rash all over my body is sort of like the last thing that you need. Uh, so I go into this little shop and, you know, they say, hey, man, you know, here's what's going on. You are having an allergic reaction uh, to something, uh, most likely your sheets or some kind of laundry detergent. So I was like, OK, well, you know, as a as a homeless kid, I'm kind of sleeping everywhere. So the likelihood that I could have like encountered something that I'm allergic to, you know, probably pretty high, except I don't really have a history of allergies. Uh, I'm a kid who can roll in poison ivy and not get it. So, but who am I, right? I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse. I don't have any clinical background. Uh, as I said earlier, all I know is basically my pediatrician from childhood. So I take the, the prescriptions they give me and say, hey, these things are gonna help you out. Take these uh, steroids and, and you'll be fine. I had to come back because I was not fine. Uh, when I came back, they said, hey, probably still the same problem. We're going to double down on it. Keep taking what you're taking. Things still did not get better. So I come back again. This time when I come back, they kind of triple down on allergies. And at this point, I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated uh, because I'm not feeling better. Uh, the rash has now led to headaches uh, and I'm starting to just feel exhausted all the time. Uh, so they send me away basically saying, you know, keep taking this stuff that's dealing with allergies that I don't think I have. Uh, <laughs> talk about the definition of insanity, going back to the you know, same thing over and over again. I go back one more time, right? Because I, I, that's all I know about healthcare. I grew up in a small town in West Virginia. We have one doctor. You go to that place and you go there till you figure out what's going on. I, I don't have a, I didn't have a concept at that time of like, shopping for healthcare of like looking up on leapfrog hospital performance. I mean, that was just not sort of something that was accessible to me at the time, nor was I even aware uh, that I could have done such things. So I keep going back to the place thinking, you know, we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure this out. After the fourth time, I kind of got the sense they're not going to figure this out. Right. So I decided to go somewhere else. So I went to a acute care center that was connected to a larger hospital system. Cause I thought, okay, you know, maybe I need to kind of step this up. Maybe it's a little bit more serious. So I go into this center uh, and what I notice there is that it's very suburban. Uh, most of the folks in the waiting room when I got there were people uh, that were coming from like soccer practice after school, ballet practice. We had some like sprained ankles, some broken bones. Uh, and there I sat, right, this uh, sort of very, flamboyant uh, homeless kid. I, you know, had a blue mohawk. I wore, you know, rainbow colored wristbands uh, so that I didn't have to tell anybody my mood. They could just look at my wristbands and understand. It was very complicated at the time and it made total sense to me then. It makes no sense to me now. So uh, all this to say, I kind of stuck out in the waiting room. Uh, so when they call me back, I have a conversation with the provider and she says to me, you know, have you had you know, an HIV test? Have you had a, a test for things like syphilis? 
And I said, I don't think so. You know, they told me they were looking for allergies. She said, all right, let's run these tests. So uh, I go away for a while and then I come back uh, and they say, hey, you know, we got those test results. And by the way, you have syphilis uh, and we're waiting on your HIV test results. They should be back soon. So at that period, uh, I was diagnosed about 10 minutes later uh, with HIV as well. And so I kind of had these two things happening. Uh, they also told me that I had hepatitis B. So here I am in my you know, little acute suburban center, uh, find out I've got HIV and a, you know, a whole bunch of little STI buddies that came along with it. And my experience there was like, great. Okay, we, we, I know what's going on. We're, we, there's a course of treatment, like this makes sense to me. As I was leaving that, ex that experience, uh, the last thing I remember is the receptionist opening the window uh, and saying to me with all the care and compassion in the world, be sure to follow up the health department with your HIV diagnosis. It was in that moment that, you know, the record stopped in the waiting room, all the ballerinas and soccer players and everybody who were there still, right, just kind of looked. Uh, unfortunately, at that time also, uh, because I was so sick at that point, my father was there with me. So that's how he found out uh, that I had HIV. My father, lovely man, cannot keep his mouth shut. Uh, so that little breach of information uh, in that waiting room where the receptionist was trying, uh, I think, in her heart of hearts to care for me and make sure that I got connected where I was supposed to get connected. Uh, it actually resulted in my father telling my sister, my sister telling her wife, her wife telling my mother, and, and it just was like a, a tree of information that got disclosed through my family. I had no choice over it. Uh, and so I lost a lot of control, right? And uh, for anybody who knows me, I can be a bit of a control freak. Uh, so all of a sudden, not only do I have this sort of joy from knowing what I have and that we're going to treat it, but I've also now got this moment of just real disdain for healthcare at that moment. I really felt like I was robbed of the opportunity to tell my story at the time I was ready to tell it. So that's how I started out HIV care. Um, after that, uh, I had to learn to navigate the health system uh, a little bit more. Uh, but this time, it wasn't just as a person with HIV, uh, it was a drug user, right, as well. So I'm kind of walking on the door uh, with these sort of two identities now uh, meeting the front, but. My HIV is kind of managed, and so what starts kind of taking over in my life uh, is things like uh, injection drug use. Um, when I say managed in HIV, for me it was I was diagnosed, and now I know. And at the time I was told, you know, you don't need to be on medicine at this point. Uh, we're going to wait for your CD4 count to drop, uh, and then we'll have a conversation later. So from my perspective, the HIV was a done deal, and I didn't really need to go to the doctor. Um, I didn't really understand the concept of retention. I thought it was just, go ahead, you're good to go. Um, at the time, uh, right after I was diagnosed with HIV is when I began uh, shooting up. It was kind of that point where I was like, well, you know, the reason I didn't shoot up prior to that was because I didn't want to get HIV. But now that I had HIV, why not take the opportunity uh, and learn a new skill? Uh, so I started shooting up, I think it was within 24 to 48 hours of being diagnosed. Uh, which then sort of exacerbated uh, the health problems that would cascade from being not only a drug user now, but an injection drug user. Uh, one of the things that started happening uh, was, as expected, uh, some problems with oral health, particularly teeth. Uh, and I started having just excruciating tooth pain. Uh, it finally got so bad that I said, I've, I've got to go to the doctor. Uh, if you're a, you know, kind of homeless, gay, sex worker, kid who's shooting up, like the last thing you want to be doing is walking into an institution, right? Whether that be, you know, sort of a police station or a hospital, right? It's just, it's very structured and it's just going to be very different than the environment that I'm walking in. But things got so bad that I really didn't have a choice. Uh, so I go into the hospital and when I was brought in, I'm a like I said, I'm a kid from West Virginia. I'm pretty earnest, pretty honest. Uh, and so they asked me all these questions about drug use and I was honest. I said, hey, yeah, I'm a drug user. I'm an injection drug user. And I, you know, use methamphetamine and, you know, kind of laid it all out there for everyone, which immediately uh, all the providers kind of take a big step back. You know, you have to go back in time. You know, this is over 10 years ago at this point. And so 
the opioid crisis, you know, lots of people were starting to get really, you know, worried about all of that stuff. It, it was, it was a growing problem. So when you got a kid walking into an emergency room, talking about being a drug user, complaining about pain, you know, it was sort of like this constellation of what is this kid really here for? Uh, I remember being on the gurney. Uh, it seemed like forever is the time I remember from the time I got there till the time I left. Um, what I remember hearing are conversations about, you know, yeah, we got a kid in there. Uh, he may be drug seeking, you know, let's kind of wait and see what's happening. Those little conversations, right? Did I hear the whole conversation? No. Did I hear pieces of it? I think so. Uh, you know, you look back at those and the experience of it was just one that I said, I'm here, I'm uncomfortable. And what I think I'm hearing is that they're uncomfortable with me being here too. And so in that moment, uh, seeking, you know, healthcare as a drug user, I felt like, you know, it wasn't just my story of discomfort, but it was also their story of discomfort. And so, whereas my experience in navigating HIV care was one of like everybody sort of, you know, kind of either not understanding or when they did understand kind of over caring, uh, navigating as a drug user, it was a little bit different, right? Uh, maybe if I had been just a person with HIV, the care would have been different, but my primary concern coming in was drug use. And I think that it was a really different experience. Uh, finally, there was a nurse uh, who I would say was gay. Uh, he was very sensitive, very lovely. Uh, and he basically walked in and said, are you still here? And I said, yeah. And he said, I'm not gonna help you here. You need to, we're gonna get you out of here. And whatever he did, whatever discharge happened, I got out of the hospital. Now the irony is, after all that, I walked out of the hospital with a prescription for painkillers. So uh, I'll leave you to figure out the moral of that story. Uh, but all I know is that when I left there, the one thing that wasn't fixed were my teeth. And so a couple of days later, two of my back molars actually cracked out, uh, and I spent the next couple of months basically walking around with you know jagged, cracked teeth. Uh, and now looking back, untreated HIV high viral load, last thing you probably want going on uh, is sort of jagged uh, teeth in your mouth, uh, especially when you're also using methamphetamine, which causes its own oral health issue. So ultimately, right, we've got these two healthcare experiences, you know, one seeking care for HIV, one seeking care for drug use. The reality is both of them kind of had the same result, which was a real breach of trust. Uh, in whatever environment, uh, whatever experience, I just learned not to trust. And unfortunately, those were the first steps that I had in the healthcare system as an adult, right? Unfortunately, this sort of lack of trust is not uh, the experience of myself alone. I am a white cisgendered male. I walk with a serious amount of privilege in this country. And yet, though that privilege could not get me through those systems and get to the care that I needed, as a drug user, it didn't get me the care that I needed as a person with HIV. Uh, and so when you think about it and knowing the privileges that are experienced by people who share those demographics, there's a lot more trust that gets broken out there beyond just not treating someone's oral health condition or disclosing their HIV status. The trust is broken daily uh, on the basis of how we treat people because of their race, their gender identity, their sex assigned at birth. But it's also broken every day in the little actions that we have, where we don't call someone back. We don't return uh, a fax that we said we were going to. We don't get a form turned in by the deadline that we committed to the client. All of these things, right, break trust over time. And when you break trust like that, the more you do it, uh, there are going to be greater and greater consequences of the small breaches of trust uh, turning into what becomes distrustful uh, systems and communities. The thing that's important uh, around the behavioral health frame here is uh, when you get into our Ryan White systems, uh, they're great. Look at our outcomes, right? Just nationally, I saw on HRSA's Instagram, they were you know, talking about viral load suppression outcomes. And while we know that when we look in there, there are still disparities that we need to address, our programs are pretty good, right? But a lot of folks with behavioral health disorders, substance use disorders, mental health disorders, are seeking care in other systems. They've sought care prior to coming to our Ryan White system. Uh, a lot of the reasons some of us end up with HIV are because of poor behavioral health care experiences. 
when we think about behavioral health and HIV, it's a syndemic, right? Uh, HIV seems to be a syndemic with a lot of things. I think a lot of folks would throw housing in there. Uh, but what we know about this particular syndemic is that behavioral health disorders put people at risk for HIV infection, and HIV infection puts people at risk for behavioral health disorders. So not only do you have this sort of syndemic nature going on, but when you're thinking about clinics, right, these things kind of work together to create these poorer outcomes. And so our systems have to be able to not only address, you know, this whole syndemic condition, but in many ways, be able to understand the dynamics of each of its component parts and not only how they interact, but the individual parts of it that don't interact, right? So that we can think about our improvement, not just as this whole big picture, but in each of these different spaces where we're called to think about patient and client experience. We know that this is a, a big problem in the, the HIV community. Uh, behavioral health conditions affect nearly 50% of persons with HIV. Up to 85% of persons with HIV report some depression symptoms. Anxiety disorders are prevalent as high as 40%. Uh, current alcohol and drug use disorders are as much as six times more likely amongst persons with HIV than the general population. And the CDC estimates that nearly 26% of persons with HIV who are engaged in medical care have some form of a depression diagnosis, a rate that is three times higher than in the general population. Uh, I should point out that these data are pre-COVID and a little bit earlier, I think they're 2016, 2015. Uh, if you were to bring this forward now uh, in light of COVID, I would be interested to look at these statistics and see uh, if we're seeing the increases in this population of people with HIV as much as we see it in persons without HIV. If so, I think it tells us we need to look at this uh, even more. So when you put all of these things together, right, how the diseases interact with one another, the prevalence rates of the disease in the population of people that the Ryan White program serves, we have to take this on because when we think about our medical programs, any medical program for people with HIV is by default a program for people with behavioral health disorders. Uh, we have to kind of think about those in both environments. So, you know, if somebody has not had a prior healthcare experience related to HIV, they may have had one related to behavioral health disorders. When I finally engaged with the Ryan White program, I came to that program with all of these experiences. But in my mind, I didn't separate out the HIV visit, the substance use visit. Like these were just sort of a collective view on healthcare. And as I mentioned earlier, what came out was distrust, right? So now I'm being told by another group of people uh, who, who are sort of in my social network about the Ryan White program. And all I can think of is like, can I trust these people, right? So when you think about trust, uh, trust to me underpins the relationship uh, between people, right? Uh, I trust that you'll be there for me when you're my friend. I trust that if I give you my money in a store for a product, you're gonna give me a good product, right? There's just all these spaces and places that we walk in where trust is just inherent and assumed and often taken for granted. Um, when we talk about lacking trust, right, it's like this element of distrust or mistrust. And I've been doing a lot of work lately uh, in my advocacy work around trust and distrust and mistrust. And I found that a lot of people confuse these words. And when you're thinking about improvement in systems, and in particularly thinking about trying to improve systems with communities of people that have historical mistrust, it's really important to understand the nuances of these concepts. When you think about trust, trust can be defined as a belief in a person's competence to complete a certain task, right? So I trust that when I leave my healthcare provider a voicemail, that they will call me back in a timely manner, right? That's a, that's a moment of trust. Distrust is based on the assumption that providers or healthcare entities may not be trustworthy, right? So maybe you don't call me back and be like, girl, don't call them. They, they don't call people back or that maybe they're not offering equal access to state-of-the-art care, right? That maybe this isn't the best place to go. I don't trust them to give me top of the line. I go over here. Uh, that the quality is variable and that the patient is likely to receive lower quality than the typical standard of care. All of these can be examples of distrust. Mistrust is something that's a little deeper than trust and distrust. And mistrust is more of a general sense of unease or suspicion towards someone or something that is predicated either on the notion that the provider or healthcare entity may not act in the patient's best interest and they may actively work against 
the patient. So whereas distrust is about me saying, maybe you won't call me back. Mistrust is saying, you're not calling me back because you know I need you to and you want to hurt me, right? It's a totally different level. And yet, what's interesting is when you go in uh, and try to research it, uh, folks show high levels of medical mistrust, right? It's not just distrust in our community. Uh, there's some great research out there about medical mistrust, particularly uh, in Black and African American populations of persons with HIV. And so when you look at this idea of, of trust or distrust and mistrust, when you're thinking about, I think, from a system perspective, you know, you need to be aiming at understanding mistrust uh, and not don't just look at distrust. Because mistrust, right, when thinking about communities of persons with HIV, uh, often we have these historical experiences engaging with healthcare systems and institutions that have taught us through our lived experience that those are not places and spaces built by us, built for us, or built with our best intentions. Often this leads to mistrust, right? Mistrust originates from these historical experiences that can be linked to a group identity, a personal experience, vicarious experience, hearing about it, and oral histories, the narratives that many communities carry their experiences in. Mistrust is, is this sort of uh, compiling of distrust. It's like when, when I distrust you, we can get into a state of trying to build our trust back. When I mistrust you, that's deeper and more about, I think, me, me trusting your character as a person or an institution. Often people try to use these interchangeably, but as I said, you know, it's really important to identify that distrust is most correctly based on a specific experience or piece of information. Mistrust expresses a general sense of unease towards someone or something. Distrust, I can tell you exactly. Mistrust, I'm just generally uncomfortable with you. So you can have a situation where patients may distrust a provider or a researcher, an organization, or an institution because they know or have heard specific things about what they've done, right? They came into the community, they asked us a lot of questions, they promised us a report back, and they never came back and talked to us, right? That can create distrust. I may not want to go work with those people again because I distrust them now. But patients may, almost, may also mistrust medical care, providers, researchers, health-related organizations, or institutions in general, where it's not about a specific thing. You may not have done anything to me, but I may look at the entire healthcare system and say, I don't trust that you have my best interest in mind. And I think many communities of people across the country uh, have a lot of, you know, sort of ammo to work with there about having legitimate reasons to not trust our healthcare systems. Uh, and that, that not trust is not just manifest in distrust, but also in mistrust. So how do we build back trust, right? So knowing that a lot of folks have already experienced it, I would say more often than not, uh, people have had a bad experience than have not had a bad experience. So in my frame, uh, it's good and very optimistic to aim at building trust. Uh, but I think it's also very realistic and pragmatic to have a serious conversation about building back trust uh, with people who perhaps the system uh, has failed in the past or who have come from a community that institutions have systematically failed over generations of time. So what I wanted to do uh, is give you some recommendations for some ways to think about how care organization uh, can be evaluated and sort of reviewed to think about trust. So when we think about behavioral health, uh, you know, there, we kind of have our two buckets, mental health and substance use disorders, knowing very well that these two folks often walk hand in hand, uh, but the treatment seems to be a little siloed still, as well as uh, we have folks uh, who do not have the comorbidity, right? Folks who are diagnosed only with a mental health disorder or only with a substance use disorder, which is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, saying we need to understand the component parts of a syndemic as much as we understand how they're interrelated. When you look at mental health care, I think what's really interesting, this is from the uh, World Health Organization, uh, and this is their uh, pyramid of the optimal mix uh, of care organization for mental health services. What I think is really great here is that most mental health care, uh, according to them, and, and you look at the real literature, the WHO doesn't put stuff out that's not based in, in evidence, 
can be self-managed or managed by informal community mental health services. For example, community groups, religious organizations, and schools. Where additional expertise and support is needed, a more formalized network of services is needed. But if I don't trust your healthcare institution and I have enormous amounts of mistrust and I'm not even walking in your door, then that screening that leads me to need to go talk to a psychiatrist is probably not gonna happen. The reality is also that the majority of the services that are needed by people are informal or self-care, right? You don't necessarily need to build trust with a huge institution to have comfort with a peer offering you services. Uh, all across the country, we are seeing community health workers, peer workers, uh, whatever word you're using to describe folks who have a shared lived experience, uh, they're trust builders right? Their interactions, the relationships that we have as people who share a community narrative uh, can help broker that relationship with the institution. Unfortunately, what's really happening in our systems right now is a lot of folks get screened, they show signs of depression, and they get referred like right up to psychiatrists who then say, yeah, you know, there's not a need for this service. And then they kind of go back down the referral pathway, really ignoring the opportunity uh, to provide self-management support or informal community care so that if somebody had some symptoms, we can keep them where they are, uh, but also recognizing that a lot of folks no-show to that psychiatrist visit, right? And we hear all the reasons in community why that happens, right? There's stigma against it. They don't trust it. They don't understand it. They don't have the access to the information. Like there's so many reasons why people don't go. But what we also know is that when you put a trusted public health uh, frontline worker like a peer and a community health worker in the role of building that trust, people show up to their mental health visits. People are willing to have conversations. People are willing to get informal community care. I may not be comfortable with my psychiatrist, but I might be comfortable going to my pastor, right? And I think it's really important the healthcare system begins thinking beyond like sort of primary care, direct, you know, to this specialty care and really looking at the community resources around you, especially in cases where somebody doesn't trust you, right? Reaching into the community and finding the people who they do trust. We're trying to provide the information that people need to care for themselves until they feel comfortable walking in. Similarly to mental health, uh, substance use, uh, SBIRT, our screening brief intervention referral to treatment model, uh, is sort of the en vogue way to think about this. It's really effective. It's a comprehensive integrated public health approach that helps you be able to identify, you know, where person's use, uh, substance use is in relationship to their risk. You know, how much harm is it causing in their life? Is this somebody who parties on one weekend or is this somebody who's shooting up a couple times a day? Recognizing that where a person's use is, people need different interventions. Well, in this space, you know, we kind of got the same thing going on. Uh, a little bit different than mental health, we do have a lot of our community-based organizations have been providing a lot of substance use support services. So there is more of a spectrum of services at the community level here. But a lot of folks all too often still come in, they screen, uh, you know, uh, positive for substance use disorder, and it's like, boom, you're going to detox. That's a fast pathway for somebody who doesn't trust the healthcare system, right? really looking down this substance use cone and thinking like, okay, if I can get you to walk in the door, how do we build trust to get you to that place, right? I feel like sometimes these referral pathways that folks provide to us in the community who've had these experiences of distrust and mistrust, it's like, that's too much trust for me to go from screening all the way into detox. There's gotta be a little bit more for me to work with there, right? To be able to get to the place where that referral is gonna land in fertile ground. So those are just two examples about how uh, particularly behavioral health services, mental health and substance use could be reorganized in a little bit of way to help leverage trust building staff as well as services sort of lower on the intensity scale uh, for people who are not ready at that point to trust a system to that level. Um, but there are other things that agencies and organizations and communities can do, right, to engage one another and each other uh, around trust and becoming trustworthy. Um, this is from a resource from the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation uh, looking at practices that were uh, trust building. Uh, and I thought that these would be a really great place for us to kind of close out the formal content uh, portion of the presentation 
and be a jumping off point for our discussion afterwards. Uh, the ABIM Foundation recommends the following strategies. Uh, the first one is around communications, knowing your patient. Uh, these are practices that emphasize communications tools, models, and channels for understanding the lived experience of patients, clinicians, and other providers. Uh, when you think about this in an improvement frame, uh, this is using things like experience-based co-design uh, and thinking about human-centered design tools and methods, right? Really looking at are we gathering the actual experience of people, right? If you want to learn to trust someone, learn to listen to them, right? Gathering the, a person's narrative is in and of itself uh, an opportunity for a trust building activity, particularly when the person trying to collect that narrative uh, has the wisdom to sit long enough to hear it. Uh, another recommendation are around conversations and support. Uh, this is sort of building off of communications, practices that encourage trusting relationships and interactions through the ways in which those providing care and those receiving care engage with each other, right? So when thinking about interventions uh, or training that we provide people about how you build and encourage trusting relationships. A lot of our work in trauma-informed care, I think lands in this environment to really think about uh, our work, cultural humility, and thinking about supportive interactions lands a lot in this space. All of those, again, aimed at sort of building trust uh, and becoming trustworthy. Um, another way to foster trust really is uh, looking to leadership, right? Practices that both demonstrate, cultivate, and support efforts to nurture trust in our practice and relationships through the healthcare system. You know, if I am a medical assistant and I decide to you know, build this giant trust with my, my clients that I'm serving. And then I turn around and I've got a whole system or a leader that allows everyone around me to break the trust, then my efforts are going to become futile, right? They're just going to sort of land in this environment of not uh, instead of what I'm trying to do, which is build an environment of trust. Another practice that fosters trust, and I think this is really important right now, uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic. And these are practices that counter misinformation in healthcare right, and or work to disseminate accurate information about medicine and health. Uh, here, I work in New Jersey now uh, after I left Virginia, and one of the things that we did immediately when COVID-19 hit was get our community health workers online, on Facebook, on Instagram, getting everybody the information. Because if I were asking folks, right, if we remember we had different administration, different time, uh, there was not a clear message coming out, right? And yet, our folks, people with HIV, highly vulnerable, already experiencing disparities in COVID, we had really nervous folks, right? And so we needed to make sure that information was getting out there correctly. That little step of putting that information out there uh, has yielded in the last, uh, you know, what, almost two years now, uh, those people come to us for information. They ask us to confirm that, yes, this is true, because they built trust with us. Right, because we were the ones helping them navigate through the misinformation. Patient-centered design, as I mentioned earlier, uh, experience-based co-design and human-centered design all sort of fall into this patient-centered design space. Uh, these are practices that ensure consistency, right, in clinical practice and focus on clinical practice approaches that position the varied interests and needs of the patients as paramount. So when you think about our improvement efforts, right, when you look at uh, not just how we collect and gather information about clients and patients, but what information interventions are we putting into place and are those also patient-centered? Have we tested the intervention that we wanna use with clients and patients? Have we reviewed all the tools and resources that we wanna disseminate for clients and patients with community members to get their feedback? All of those would be patient-centered design elements that help build trust. The next one is about transparency. Uh, and this is really practices that reflect full disclosure of clinical and other information. And that would be important for good healthcare decision-making and effective healthcare delivery. Uh, people know when you're not telling the truth. They know when you're hiding something, especially community level, right? Uh, secrets are not kept inside institutions. And so transparency, even when it's scary and what you've got to say might be awful, that level of transparency builds trust because people think nobody tells them the truth anymore, right? The last practice that's recommended uh, from the ABIM Foundation in their, their trust uh, series is around practices that promote awareness of and engagement involving the costs of healthcare and potential impact on patients and health systems. So if you're sending me somewhere to get a referral and it's gonna cost me money, making sure I understand that upfront. If it is gonna cost me money, maybe it's worth it, 
right? Help me have that conversation about understanding uh, the pros and cons of, of purchasing this healthcare, right? Uh, and really making sure, I think, as always, as Ryan White programs, uh, preaching to the choir here, but just being good stewards of our resources so that the value we are producing and communicating that uh, to people builds trust. You know, it's like when you look at the amount of Ryan White dollars and the outcomes that people are able to achieve with them, that's a story worth telling. And it's one that I can tell you as a person with HIV helped me build trust with the system. So with that, uh, what we would do now uh, is get ready to move us to the live portion of the breakout session where we will invite uh, any questions or comments from folks. But for now, uh, thank you for listening and I look forward to our discussion in just a few moments. Adam, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm gonna give everybody a few seconds to put their questions in the chat. My name is Ashley Nantahongsa Mosley. I'm gonna be your Q&A facilitator today. Um, so I'll just give you a few moments and then we can get started in dialogue. Thank you, Laz. One question that we have is, uh, how do you think agencies can try to gain clients' trust after there has been a breach? Great, thanks so much. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say hello to everyone. Uh, it is really great to see some names that are very familiar uh, to me from my previous time in Virginia. Uh, thanks so much for the question. So when thinking about how do you build back trust, I think the first step is really recognizing that you have to admit that trust was broken in the first place. Uh, and that can be something that is specific to your agency or organization, a specific event or a history of events, or just a general you know, mistrust of the organization. But it could also be at a more macro level, recognizing that there may be at the systems level, a distrust. So it's really important to kind of understand what you're trying to, you know, analyze what you're trying to fix. Uh, but also, I think it, just to kind of pull out a little bit from the presentation, you know, the utilization of people who have a shared lived experience with the people you're serving, whether that's HIV, diabetes, history of behavioral health disorders, you know, it's people who've walked the path uh, who are currently in care that obviously have found some value there. Uh, they are going to care. And I think those kinds of folks can be really good bridges. Uh, we have great programs, uh, community health workers, peer mentorships, uh, all of the sort of pieces of our healthcare system that are you know, being built and you know, getting more sophisticated to sort of leverage community members. But it's also important to remember that you know, all of us working in health systems from the you know, C-suite all the way uh, to our frontline workers are all generally at various points in their life, patients as well. Um, patients have skills. They are doctors and nurses and medical assistants. Uh, and so people with HIV can also fill all of those positions. And so when you're thinking about how do you build back trust, uh, part of that is that transparency uh, as well. You know, organizations work very, I think they work pretty hard to try and be representative these days, right? Uh, at least I think the good ones are. Uh, and so when you have that representativeness, uh, I think it's about leveraging that, right? Helping to reshape the narrative in the community uh, by looking to people from the community uh, who have a different understanding of that narrative. Um, people will not always want to trust you again. You know, I think I, I don't, I'm, I'm still a little bit on the young end of the age spectrum. So I won't say like, you know, I've got decades of belief in this, but, you know, I've definitely seen that there are some folks that things happen to them that they either don't want to or choose not to get over. And, you know, you just have to kind of understand that reality of folks. But, you know, the hand that I think I would shake most is the hand I've already shaken. Uh, so again, sort of repositioning that role, of, particularly in systems like Ryan White, uh, people with HIV, both in service provision and in leadership, uh, both in the development and planning of these programs, as well as the implementation and evaluation. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Laz, for your question. Our next question is, thank you, Maria. 
She said, thank you for sharing your story. After the nurses outed your results, did you want to talk to anyone about uh, grievances or did the providers even tell you about proper grievance procedures? So that, great question. Uh, I think, you know, when I think back to that time, I was, you know, as I mentioned, my healthcare experience was pediatrician. That was mo mostly managed through my mom. Uh, and that even started, you know, cutting out in my life around probably when I was 13 or 14 years old. Uh, now, as a person who works in healthcare and quality measurement, I have all of this great understanding of what all of the mechanisms of accountability are for healthcare. But at that time, you know, in an acute care center, I maybe I signed a piece of paper, consent to treat, perhaps, right? I mean, I can totally admit, like, that there are certainly documents, but did somebody reach out, you know, and say, hey, oh my gosh, not really. And, and I think generally because one, I don't think they be, were aware that that happened in, in the way that it was received by me. Uh, and two, I wasn't going to go back to care there. You know, the referral was going somewhere else. So that sort of pathway to understanding there was a grievance to be had and that there was a process, you know, to file it. I just, that was not information accessible to me at the time or that I was even aware you could do. Now, what I will say though is, uh, and I mentioned this uh, yesterday, you know, the public health system in Virginia, uh, you know, saved my life. Uh, there was an outreach worker at the time in Northern Virginia, uh, Tomas Cabrera. He had been an outreach worker supporting me uh, while I was, you know, before I was uh, uh, a person with HIV back when I was just a wayward kid uh, running through the city. And, you know, he maintained that relationship over time. And when I was diagnosed with HIV and he heard about that experience, he was the first one to say, you know, Adam, that, that is not how that's supposed to happen. You know, we have a lot of training in Virginia. We have a lot of programs uh, aimed at making sure these kinds of experiences don't occur. So first thing he communicated to me was that was an exception and it shouldn't have been that way. Uh, the second thing he communicated was there's a forum that you can go to to sort of tell these stories of people who are interested in this. They want to take action on this. Uh, and at that time, he referred me to Elaine Martin uh, at the prevention side uh, of the HIV house at that time. Uh, and Elaine was like, yeah, we have this thing called the HIV planning group. We look for community members to be engaged and involved. Um, I then started working at a community-based organization in Charlottesville that was providing services funded from the state. And so it was this immediate outlet to both one, uh, you know, communicate that this had occurred and second, to find a place and a space uh, now that the sort of Legos of my life were falling uh, into better place to kind of put that experience to use. Uh, as an outreach worker, I learned, you know, I think we all learned this, like it's like you have an expiration date on your services, right? Once you step out of an environment, there's only so long that you can still sort of have that point back in. And so I, I feel very privileged to have had that opportunity to both speak my grievance in a public forum, but also then have, you know, almost an immediate pathway to sort of do something about it. I don't think everyone is offered that opportunity. And I think that's even bigger than a grievance, right? Which is like, I can file a piece of paper and I can get an apology. But I think from a community perspective, the grievance is about being heard uh, and having some kind of agency, perceived agency to make sure it doesn't happen to someone else. I think that really speaks to the altruism of people with HIV. You know, awful things happen to us. And in my experience, at least, what I hear from our community is how do we make sure this doesn't happen to someone else? right, taking what could be an enormous amount of anger uh, and turning that into an enormous amount of support and passion. So that's how I stand in it. But long story to say, yeah, nobody told me I was allowed to complain about that until I sort of engaged with the Ryan White program. Thank you, Adam. Thank you all. We have a few more questions coming in. Thank you, Rob, for your question. He says, hi, Adam, great to see you as always. Can you talk a little bit about how people with HIV can intervene and partner in healthcare systems can work to change community experiences of those systems and how systems can be sure to include people with HIV? The end quote, nothing about us without us, end quote. Absolutely. So that is a uh, big question. Let me try to unpack the pieces of it. So uh, first, how can we intervene and partner in healthcare systems? I think part of it is going in and taking those jobs, 
right, when they come open and saying, I want to be a part of this system. These systems say they need us to be a part of it. More and more, the measurement is showing they need us to be a part of this. And so part of it is community stepping up to take on those roles. I have also seen those of us who have the access and the resources to move forward. Sorry, my cat's joining us. Uh, those of us who have the accesses and the resources, uh, I see a lot of people in my community getting very educated. Uh, they are going back to school, uh, they are picking up new skills, and a lot of them are in the healthcare field. Uh, and not just in a clinical sense, but in a non-clinical sense as well, becoming social workers, counselors, uh, you know, peer certified peer workers. There's just this whole onslaught of opportunity. I think the systems need to open the doors uh, and make it a little bit easier for us to partner in those spaces. Uh, I can tell you as a person with HIV who has worked in a clinic, in a CBO, like uh, I ran an AIDS education and training center regional partner. So it's, I've seen all these pieces and it's, I think, twice as hard uh, because you are behind the stage a little bit in the curtain where you see more about people's attitudes and behaviors and knowledge. And I think it can be a little disheartening uh, to kind of jump into what you saw as an opportunity and a problem and find out it's, it's a little bit bigger than you thought. Um, the other challenge when we partner with systems is they tend to rely on like the one or two of us and they're like, oh, we have our two people and that's all we need. Um, and so that ends up in a space and a place that kind of puts us, I think, in a hard situation uh, because it sort of relies on us to both not only bring our own lived experience, but then serve as advocates for the community. Uh, we have advocates in the community. So it's thinking about how do we not rely on a single person inside our walls uh, to establish that partnership. People inside our walls can be great at building bridges and figuring out how you recruit those partners, how you bring people in, but you kind of have to then give up the institutional power and allow those people with HIV, regardless of their position in the system, to center sort of their understanding of what needs to be done. Um, providers, I think, I, I've never really met anyone who's like, no, we don't want a patient involved here. There are concerns people have, mostly relating to things like confidentiality and like, oh, well, what about this information? And a lot of those can be managed very quickly with policy and procedure reviews. But at the end of the day, right, you have to sort of recognize that with people with HIV inside your walls, your greatest ambassador is your own staff. Uh, and if your own staff aren't talking well about you, right, then those are critical conversations to have. But if your staff, right, uh, who are from the community, feel like they're part of the team, feel that the team is doing a good job, uh, that narrative will carry itself into the community. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks who are like, oh, you can't get your care where you work. And there's a lot of reasons not to do that. I'm not going to open that whole can of worms. But I think a person should want to get services where they work. Right. So maybe it's not a matter of ethically I should, but I, I think I would want to, right, if I believe in that place. So when you talk about that partnership, you've got to establish the mechanisms inside the organization to actively recruit for people with HIV, find ways you communicate that that lived experience, whether it's of a person with HIV or a person with a history of behavioral health disorders, that that experience is both valued and welcomed. Uh, the secondary part of this real quick that I want to mention is you also have to have a culture inside of the organization that allows people uh, permission to bring their identities into work. Um, I do a lot of work, as I mentioned, uh, with sort of a, the quality form and quality measurement. Uh, and one of the things that I'm always astounded by is I sit at these tables of the you know, nation's largest measurement experts, right? And there are an enormous number of women of color. And when we start talking about measures that don't you know, use disparity data that don't have stratification by race and ethnicity. Um, I'm often intrigued, right, by why our identities as people who are not measurement experts don't come into that conversation. I feel the pressure to only talk about the science and not talk about how this lands as a gay person, right? And yet in our systems, we have women of color, gay men of color, white cisgender men, like we've got all kinds of people that come from all the spaces and places of people with HIV. But I don't think all of us feel uncomfortable or empowered or even encouraged to look at our work through those lenses and that experience. Uh, often, if you want to know if your organization you know, has a problem with racism, ask the people of color inside your organization, right? They are as aware of what is happening as the people outside of it. Always remember the people in your clinic 
live in your community generally. So whatever is happening outside those walls that we structure so carefully is going to be reflected often inside those walls it, with a shared awareness of the narrative of that institution. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Rob, for your question. We have a few more questions. Uh, thank you, Sam, for your next question. Sam says, thank you for your engaging and thought-provoking presentation. What do you see as the role of individual healthcare providers in fostering or rebuilding trust? It is enormously important <laughs> for healthcare providers to constantly look at their work through a lens of, and is what I'm doing building trust or is it breaking trust, right? And it's one of those critical lenses and it's things like, you know, I, I, I'm a busy person too. I look at my email and I'm like, oh, there's a hundred emails in there. I'm not gonna respond to it, right? And I sometimes forget that those little lack of responses, I'm breaking trust with all the people and my colleagues and like, oh, he was supposed to do this and that didn't happen. And that can affect my professional network. But when you're talking about a patient, right? It's like those kinds of little things where I say, oh, I'm gonna follow up on this. You know, when you have a panel of 2000 patients, it's easy to forget to follow up on that. And yet I'm the patient, I only have one provider, right? So I remember that that action, you know, created a, a, an amount of distrust. And sometimes I think uh, in team-based care in particular, we can kind of move trust off our plates and accidentally without meaning to. And it's that whole idea of like, I did my job well, but we didn't do our job well. And I think a lot of trust breaking happens in those environments where you have really great individuals, but they're not thinking about the context where I say, yeah, I'll follow up. I tell someone else to, and then it doesn't happen. So there's this sort of like a uh, causal chain around you know where the communication was happening and how that trust got broken. But I think when you're talking about sort of like one-on-one -on -one in an encounter with people, uh, I think there's a huge responsibility uh, on providers to not just build trust, but I think it's more about trust as a component of a good relationship, right? That that should be what we're seeking to do. Um, there's a lot of great work around perspective taking tools, resources, uh, little you know mnemonics and, and handouts that you can use to help guide a conversation with someone. Um, when I uh, am with my doctor, you know, I've had all kinds of different doctors, great ones, terrible ones, like you name it, all the way in the middle. The ones that I remember most are the ones that I felt less directed in what was happening. Like I remember going to see them and we had conversations and I, you know, we kind of decided what my health was going to look like. But it's when there wasn't trust that I was going to like take my medication. That was like weird for me. I was like, yeah, I'm a drug user, but that means I'm good at taking drugs. So like, I don't understand the problem, right? You're just adding more drugs to the drugs I'm already taking. I understand this. But like when people approached me as a population instead of a person, then that becomes a risk, right? Because we're like, oh, injection drug use is associated with, you know, lower adherence and blah, 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 right? I know all the research, I know all the studies, but what I can tell you is the people that I know who were supported as injection drug users to be adherent we're totally fine taking their medication, but that's about trust, right? It's uh, a friend of mine talks a lot about having positive regard, right? For the folks that you're working with and that you will always try to see things from a perspective that makes sense, right? Right. So like whatever I'm seeing in front of me, how does this make sense? Because to build trust with me, I think you have to be willing to see the world through my perspective. You don't have to adopt my perspective, but I think trust and respect exist in a place where all of our perspectives are shared and valued and in the context of healthcare are transparent, right? That we are telling each other what's really going on uh, and that we're not hiding decisions about our treatment that we may or may not offer people uh, because we will find out, right? We will hear from other folks. So I think providers have a huge responsibility both at a level of managing their communication but also when thinking about an encounter. When rebuilding trust, Right now I'm working on a project looking at rap, the initiation of rapid start uh, and we're looking at rapid restart, which is folks who have been lost to care. And I will tell you, it's a very different conversation. Um, I have fallen out of care before, uh, mostly because I got busy in work, which is a common thing that happens uh, with people with HIV who enter into the healthcare system. We start uh, operating like healthcare workers and we stop taking care of ourselves as well as we used to. Uh, and so when you look at sort of how all of this uh, gets built and sort of looking in the future, 
when you're rebuilding trust, I would kind of hearken back to that first comment I made, which was you have to admit that trust at, was first broken and try to understand that and try to at least as best you can uh, know what the pathway of that broken trust was so that one, you, it, we can make sure we don't do it again. Uh, and two, if there are additional things we need to do to you know, put on additional services or differentiate the services that we offer that person because there is a lack of trust, uh, then that's an important thing to do, especially as people are coming back into care. Everybody, people leave for a reason and they decide to come back for a reason. And that can be super emotional. It could also be pressured from other people. Uh, there are lots of reasons people decide to come back to care, but understanding why they left and why they come back, I think, is that genuine interest uh, in other human beings, which is part of cultural humility, but really critical in that re-engagement. Thank you so much for your question, Sam. Thank you, Adam. Our next question that we have. Thank you for your next question, Michelle. How do you feel about Sorry, how do you feel would be the best way to gain feedback from new clients following care, whether it be agency or provider visits, immediate on-site surveys, or personal follow-up check-in to determine a client's comfort level with the agency or care provider? All of the above, right? I think any one of those strategies could actually work really well. What I would say is you've got to think about the strategy that you're using and how you tailor it to a person uh, who would be a new client. New clients, right? We don't know the environment. We're learning the environment. Things can be very overwhelming. There could be an enormous amount of need that people are walking in the door with if they have not engaged with the social service system before. And like an HIV diagnosis is the sort of uh, triggering event that brings you into care. Um, one of the things that I would say is right after somebody's been in care, I've seen this great thing. New York State did this statewide. Uh, it was called the Healthcare Stories Project. And they have like a whole toolkit online. And you basically just ask everybody right after their visit one word to describe how it felt today. Right. Great. Awesome. Terrible. Sick. You know, whatever people did. And then they would kind of ask people to make these statements throughout their care journey. So it was like one thing in the waiting room, one thing when you got in the room one thing when you left. Then they created these word clouds over each of those stations and distributed those word clouds to the staff members who delivered services in that particular process point. That allowed them to get, I think, a really good sense of not like, you know, did we, you know, monitor everyone's blood pressure appropriately? Of course we did. It's healthcare. Everybody does that. But like, how did it feel? when that happened, right? Were we rushed? Were we upset? You know, like people don't like stepping on scales. Let's have a conversation about that, right? Like there are these points in healthcare that'll come out if you ask people how they feel, right? And just real quick right after. You can also do follow-up surveys. You know, those I think, think carefully about the number of questions and how the survey is delivered. If you send me a survey on a phone and a text and I push a button and it goes right to the website and there's three little questions and I just got to push them, I will respond to you all day long, but I have a phone. I know how it works. This is my way of communicating. Not everybody does that. So you have to kind of think about the strategy that you're using in the community that you serve, right? Uh, people have much more access than they used to, to things like a smartphone and the ability to do a survey. In fact, I think there's a lot of bias still in healthcare systems that think less of us have access to this than we really do. Uh, and I think COVID-19 saw that while there still is this enhanced access, we have literacy around that access that is still a concern. So thinking critically about, you know, how you deliver a survey. Um, but also I think, uh, Community health, I, I keep going back to peers, right? Community health workers, volunteers, uh, you know, there are a lot of people with HIV who have a couple hours a week and they would love to give back to the community. But when we've institutionalized our peer support into like a, a position, a community health worker, unfortunately, somehow we've begun to again devalue the, you know, what a community member can do uh, and is willing to do uh, even without a paycheck, right? I mean, we, had buddies for years where people are like, I've got time, I want to volunteer. I knew people in Charlottesville who did this for each other, right? It was like a network that supported. And so if you want to know how somebody's first visit went, right, send someone from the community to have a conversation with them, right? Who understands, who can pick up on the cues that someone's having, or who can reorient and sort of help someone understand when something wasn't right. Like, wow, that's, that's really strange that you should follow up on that, that whole role that like, 
Tomas and Elaine provided for me to kind of reorient what is good quality, you know, a peer, a, a person from the community can have that conversation. So I would say you can use any of those methods. Uh, each one will give you something a little different, but I think they'll all give you information that's super helpful. Thank you for your question, Michelle. Sheila's next question says, hi everyone. Thank you, Adam, for a great presentation. I think that education is the key. Owning one's humility and bias can help healthcare providers help their clients in a respectful and dignified manner. Absolutely. I will tell you all the stigma research shows that most healthcare providers are completely unaware that they're doing it, right? And when you bring that awareness, a lot of folks are, they're mortified, like they really are, because they do not think of themselves as individuals who stigmatize others. If anything, they think of themselves as somewhat less capable of stigmatizing others because of sort of the education, the experience. And yet when you put it in front of them and you kind of show it in ways that I think are respectful, that again, that positive regard, same thing we have with clients. Whenever I go sort of talk about it in the healthcare environment, you gotta have that same positive regard for folks, which says, you are healers. You took an oath. Like you show up every day working in our HIV clinics that probably pays you less than you would get somewhere else. Like all of those things. And so when we land in the environment to talk about it, I think the first thing I try to do is just say, here's what it looks like from our perspective. And 75% of the lights in the room go on. They're like, oh, oh my goodness, we have to do something about this. About 25%, I noticed, they'll kind of push back, right? And that's sort of expected when you challenge a person's privilege. That is sort of what is going to happen, especially if they believe strongly about their understanding of that privilege. But helping people understand pathways to reflection that allow them to use, like, healthcare providers, they're brain people, right? Like, I love to be in my feelings. I have a theology degree. That's what we do. We get into feelings, right? These are scientists, right? They get into their brains. And so, you have to take all of that and put it in the brain space and be like, this is how we make decisions. This is how it affects us. And when they understand, at least in my experience, you put it in that framework, they're like, wow, yeah, totally. We got to do something about this. But getting the admittance of that step is the first one, but you have to immediately follow it up with not just awareness, but here are debiasing strategies, things you can do and support and training to implement them. Again, if anybody has any more questions, we have one more question in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Adriana, for your question. The comment says, thank you for sharing your story. I love to hear how you ended up in your, I would love to hear how you ended up in your current role. How can an agency navigate work through consistently having to introduce new staff to their patients? Our program has lost many members who've been part of the program for many years. Yes. So two things, how I ended up, how I ended up in my current role, uh, I had many, many years ago, a boss by the name of Bruce Taylor, uh, who is still there in Virginia. Uh, and Bruce, I think, believed strongly in community members having sort of a role and a say and a purpose uh, in us. Uh, our colleagues at that time were super amazing. Uh, Nakaya has gone on to become the mayor of Charlottesville. Uh, you know, it was just this beautiful, beautiful little office where he, you know, he was a college professor before. He taught us a lot. He gave me access to a lot of information that I think, you know, I'm learning now that I'm in graduate school, but, you know, when you're a injection drug using kid coming off the streets trying to do this work, I had an incredible privilege of a person who spent a lot of time and effort making sure that those of us on the front lines had as much knowledge and information and access to that as possible. Uh, so my current role was access from a lot of people in that agency and organization who taught me a lot about how things work. Um, but also at the state level, uh, Diana Jordan uh, and Elaine Martin uh, and Safari uh, Diawara, like all of the quality folks, like they created a lot of space for people with HIV. And I was able to have sort of like the opportunity and the privilege to step into that space uh, and learn, again, a lot of stuff that you know, again, learning in graduate school now, but, you know, to have that kind of information as a community member, um, that's how I got where I am, right? Uh, I, I also, I, you know, I put in a little bit of hard work, but mostly uh, it was a lot of access to some really great uh, mentors and leaders uh, in public health. 
So the second part, how can an agency navigate working through consistently having to introduce new staff? So I'm going to answer this in two ways. One is how do we fix the, how do we address the problem that exists and how do we fix the problem? So uh, first, let me start with fixing the problem. Uh, when you look at healthcare, uh, and this is coming from a patient, so uh, hopefully uh, it, it is okay to say this. We, I think, over-focus sometimes on patients and not enough on our partners uh, who are providing healthcare in our systems. Um, it is why I've been drawn to experience-based co-design as a QI methodology. It is why I have been drawn to looking at clinician experience as a critical factor. Uh, in how improvement happens and how uh, what improvement looks like. Um, if you want to stop having to introduce new people, you've got to figure out how do we get our staff to stay here, right? I have seen, you know, a, like sort of people graduating out, right? Like retiring, that's one thing. And we definitely see that generationally happen where like, you know, a whole clinic will move out because it's just been a generation. But that again is about planning, right? If you're an organization that ends up at a space or a place where, the entire sort of brain of the organization is all from the same generation and the same age, and they all retire at the same time. That's a strategic planning problem. And yet I see a lot of places end up that way because you get comfortable. It's like a family, right? I mean, I get it. I've worked in the family environment. And so you get comfortable with those people, but you have to be thinking about not only how are you recruiting new people and how are you placing those new people within the organization to feel comfortable and confident, and you'll have a pathway uh, to kind of move up but you also have to figure out how do we retain staff so that if people are leaving because they got new education or they got like a position that, you know, you have groomed them to take, that's one thing. I want to see people that work for me do amazing, successful things elsewhere, right? That's great. I don't want them staying around me because they're going to come take my job, get them out, right? <laughs> Go do something beautiful elsewhere. But if you find that you're just bleeding staff constantly, that's got to stop right? You have to figure out why are people leaving? Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's the culture, the work environment. Sometimes it's all of the above, but you've got to address that because that is a root problem and you will continue to have problems uh, that will show not only in relationships with new clients, but you know when you have new staff moving in and out like that, systems don't work as well. People make more mistakes. Training is harder. It's super expensive to train new people. So now your resources are dedicated in a different way. So that's one way. Now, what do you do with the current problem? Seen a couple strategies about this. Uh, one, uh, people have put like all the faces of the people that work there on the wall. So that like when you come in, it's like, there they are. This is who works here. Uh, other people, uh, especially in a team-based care environment, it's like, this is your team. And when you get a new team member, you kind of like introduce via the team. I think the challenge we have now is people with HIV, especially those of us uh, who are suppressed sort of durably long term, is that we're not engaging with the healthcare system at the same frequency that we were. So whereas before I might have gone to see, you know, my healthcare, my HIV provider every three months, now I see my HIV specialist once a year and I see a primary care doctor for my other medical visit. And each of them draws a viral load. So like everything is being co-managed and maintained, but like you could turn over three healthcare staffs in a year, right? I've seen it happen, right? I've watched clinics lose, like, you know, get a doctor, lose a doctor, get a nurse, lose a nurse. And so that, I think what we need to do is look into our primary care partners and sort of say, hey, as the folks who deliver this kind of care, what are the strategies that you use? Uh, I think you'll hear from them. A lot of that trust building stuff that we just talked about, uh, maintaining communication, understanding, you know, how you communicate with people on a regular basis, even when you're only expecting to see them once a year, right? So somewhat it's the mechanics of the conversation, it's the great resignation, it's the dynamics of the healthcare environment. It's a perfect storm of a lot of things, which is why I would say put you know, as much of your effort as you can, knowing you've got to manage the current problem into fixing it and see what can we do to understand our employee morale or the challenges our employees have uh, to staying in our environment while also figuring out, you know, do you have a once a month social or, an, you know, once every three months social where people come together? Because remember, I don't need my whole clinic to walk in the door. But if I can get my community advocates to walk in the door who are going to talk to this new person, know the new person, they're the ones that go back out to the meetings that I go to. They're the ones that I see when I'm at the grocery store and they'll be like, hey, do you hear about this new person over there? She's great. Yeah, you'll love her. Where do you meet her? Right? Like it's, putting that word out in the community before you wait for me to show up at the door and be like, whoa, 
who are all of you? Because if I believe I have a relationship, right, which is what healthcare tells us we're supposed to have, then when you leave that relationship and you don't tell me nothing, of course, I'm going to feel a way about it because I thought it was important to us. So maybe don't wait until someone like is coming to their visit to introduce their new team member. Maybe it's announcing to everyone who is being cared for by that person when they leave and who the new person is. Those are strategies, just some recommendations, but I think ultimately focus on employee retention because this is a, a byproduct of that. Thank you for your question. And Adriana said, thanks so much, very helpful. We have about 15 minutes left. We have one more comment in the chat. If you guys have a last minute questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, thank you, Laz, for your next question. That question is, can you share or recommend trainings for providers to participate in? Sure, so uh, what I will say first is, you know, when you are trying to train in this space about things like engagement, connection, these are, these are communication skills. These are things you have to practice. These are things you have to learn. Uh, interviewing people, right? Motivational interviewing. Uh, it's one of those things that I see people, they do it for like, a, you know, the, what is it? The spirit of MI, the tools of MI. We do it too up here. And it's like these three hour sessions. And I can just tell you, you can't learn that in that amount of time. So my first recommendation about what training we could go to is take a look at all of the sort of assumed competencies in our systems around training and really critically ask whether we gave people information about what this is or whether we actually trained people to deliver a service with some level of competency using these methods or strategies. Uh, for example, I'll only speak to New Jersey, uh, and I love my New Jersey, don't get me wrong, I'm not shading them, they're wonderful providers. But when we brought in the SBIRT model, everyone said, oh yeah, we SBIRT our patients all the time. And I was like, what, is that, what does that mean to you to be SBIRTed? Like, explain that to me. And they said, oh, well, you know, we screen them. And then what, right? And it became very clear to us that everyone for some reason had in their minds that SBIRT was a screening. They used their substance use tool. They screened you, it was positive and on they went. Which, oh my gosh, misses like the BERT, right? <laughs> like it's, they did the S, ignored the BERT and the BERT part is the most important, right? The brief intervention and then ultimately if needed a referral to treatment. It's those kinds of little places and gaps in our community, in our competencies and our systems that I think we've got to shore up. Right. And it's not I'm not saying that, like, everybody's out there, like, doing terrible motivational interviewing. No, there are amazing people out there doing wonderful motivational interviewing. I think what we've got to do is figure out, like, how do we get everyone to that level so that there is this same ability uh, to kind of, you know, deploy that uh, from a training perspective. Additionally, a lot of our engagement in systems, it's stigma, it's discrimination. These are big problems. Right. <laughs> this is not something that you like get together with your QI team on a Monday at 3.30 and we're like, we are no longer racist in our agency. Like, this is a big thing. And what you're unpacking is not just how does an institution or an agency or an organization contribute either maybe from a policy or a procedural level or a practice that sort of stigmatizes or discriminates. You're also asking your staff to sort of unlearn and deprogram themselves from their own biases. That takes time, it takes space, right? Again, I'm a theology person. So like reflection is like the tool that I reach for uh, when I think about that. But reflection is just like anything else. It's a skill, you've got to practice it, you've got to learn it. Uh, and I don't think we give folks a lot of space and place to reflect, right? We're too busy, right? We've got patients coming in the door, clients calling on the weekend, two in the morning, three in the morning. We're trying to get people to do less, right? And so here I, you know, understand the sort of avalanche that I'm coming up against, but I think that if we found ways that we structure reflection into our environments, and the way that works is you've got to teach the people to do it. Um, nationally, NMAC now has a program called Escalate. There's a training on stigma. It's five days for providers to do that, to sit in reflection and in conversation with one another about their systems, their care, their treatment, right? It was, it's a it's a dialogue that we invite people to. And I think those kinds of trainings, they take a lot of commitment, they take a lot of time. I am under no uh, you know, false pretenses that this is an easy thing to do. But there is something valuable about helping people reflect on their own 
identity in the world that will help them be better providers. Because right now it's all about you're stigmatizing, you're discriminating, you're a bad system. And the conversation that destigmatizes the most is the one that starts with yourself and understanding my own under my own biases, my own, you know, contribution to discrimination in the world. If you move the people in the organization that way, the organization will begin to be unsustainable for those people because the policies and the procedures and the practices will no longer be reflecting the values in the way they see the world, right? So you could change a policy and fight your staff. It's one way to do it. Or you could change your staff and inspire a new policy. And I think that effort to shift the sort of mental mode of, of the way we think is going to yield more results. Poetry question, Laz. Just two comments. Rob, um, just a comment on the staff turnover question. This is especially tough in teaching hospitals and clinics where fellows and residents are constantly changing. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. So I, the way I think about that, I was younger, I was more willing to be changed, but I always called them my doogie. Uh, and they were the resident that would come in, uh, our doogie Hauser. I, that was like an age thing. I know most people who are younger are like, what is this old guy talking about? Uh, but the residents would come in and, you know, that was an opportunity that having had that experience, uh, thank you, Rob, for bringing that up. Having had that experience, I am keenly attentive to that when I work with academic med medical centers, asking about who is the primary relationship of your patient with? Is it the attending or the resident? And how is that determined? Uh, and understanding that if you seat the primary relationship in that of the resident, then what are the structural things you are putting into place to build that relationship every two years, right? Like it's, it is absolutely something where you have to either you know, reorient the primary relationship up to the attending or seriously think about how this introduction happens. Because in my case, some were very good about the introduction and others were just like, oh, here's this new person and they're going to look at all your body parts. And they ask you all the questions again, right? I mean, it's, it's their job. They're learning. And I understand that. And that's part of going to an academic medical center, but not having a process by which patients understand that and they kind of can be a part of the process uh, I always thought it was stupid that they didn't engage us to teach those residents, right? Like, what is the feedback we could offer you since you are newly providing care? Uh, but great point, Rob. It can be very difficult when the method of your sort of institution, you know, by design necessitates that kind of movement like medical education does. Thank you for your comment, Rob. Michelle just said, just a comment for Adam. I've attended many of your presentations over the past couple of years in different forums and thoroughly enjoyed them all and learned from each one of them. You are appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> so we are coming up on time. It looks like we have five minutes left. We can give it a few more moments um, if anyone has any further questions, but... Um, Adam, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, if anyone has any comments, you can put them into the chat and we will give you back a five minutes um, for your break time. Great. Thanks so much for having me. And it was uh, great to see familiar names. Good to see you all. Thank you all. Enjoy your break. Uh, Adam and I will be hanging back just a little. <clears throat>
Thank you all. Enjoy your break. The afternoon session will start at two o'clock. Thanks so much. All right, great job, everyone. Y'all are welcome to leave, but appreciate everything. Ashley, Adam, y'all did great. Thank you, Brad. Thank, Thank you, Adam. Ashley. You're amazing. You're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I will email you soon if I go to Scotland. Child, I'm happy to, to connect you with my wild friends over there. Sounds great. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone.